This morning's scripture reading comes to us from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 13. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but do not quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the ones who eat. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days are alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother, or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another brother. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Doug. Well, this morning we're going to finish our short series, Living for Christ, as we've been in the book of Romans for the last six weeks. And today we're going to talk about a, a subject that everyone loves to talk about, like what are the rules of arguing? No, really, we're going to be talking about uh, what it looks like to live for Christ when we disagree, when we disagree on disputable matters. Like, there's no uh, secret that there are disagreements that happen in the context of the church and certainly in our culture. Recently, I just looked up to see, like, how many different issues are on a given political platform. Now, I'm not here to talk about a political platform or to talk about specific things, but I just looked. And there were roughly uh, 15, 16 different categories, over two 140 different issues on some of these different things. And maybe if you were to look at the specifics, you might add some different things to some of those items. And I don't want us to get distracted by those, but everyone in the room has some opinions on these. And these don't even include things that maybe are more important to those in the church. So the reality is, we have opinions. How do we navigate that when we disagree with one another? What does the Bible have to tell us about what we do when we disagree? Well, in God's kindness, he has given us a chapter here in the book of Romans to teach us what it looks like to navigate disputable matters. Those are things that we would be have a difference of opinion about. Like there are some things that aren't disputable. So what are some of those things? God's word is authoritative. These are God's words. They are breathed out by God. They're profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. God's word has authority. There's only one God. He's the only God. He exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is God. Jesus is the only way for us to have a relationship with God. Those are the things that are absolutely, like, we, we aren't going to waver on those. We're going to die on those hills. But Paul here is not addressing those things. He's saying, hey, when there are issues uh, that are important but not absolutely essential, there's a way to navigate that. Rather than creating a culture of division, there needs to be a culture of love. Rather than distancing ourselves from people who might have a different perspective, we are to lean in because we are found in Christ. 
So I want to talk about seven different, uh, per, seven different uh, guiding principles for us as we navigate this. But before I talk about those, let's just look at the background of this. Because even as this text was written, there are some things there that you're like, I don't, I don't remember the last time I disagreed with someone on dietary restrictions. I mean, it says here one person believes he may eat anything while the one person eats only vegetables, you know, while the weak person. So some of you, like, immediately read that and you're like, honey, we we don't need to eat salad. That's for the weak people. We should have steak, just meat. Like, don't be distracted by some of those things. Just to understand the context, Paul is preaching to people, some of which grew up as Jews, so there were different regulations and, and the law that they followed, and then there were others who weren't Jews, and they all have come to faith in Christ. So some have some convictions, I can observe these things or eat these things and only these things, and that's important. And others are like, no, I don't have to observe those things. And so that was the context, but he realized this wasn't about those things. He was like, well, you know, I'm observing that there is division that's happening when division shouldn't be happening. He's not saying you shouldn't have a perspective, and we'll talk about that as we go through the text. Like, we should have a perspective. But how do we respond when others disagree? with us about important issues, but maybe that they're not 100% clear in Scripture. What might an issue of that be? Well, here's an example. Uh, Church government. Like, there are different churches you know of. They have a congregational rule, elder form rule. Maybe we, we don't have a large church. We only meet in homes, and there's different ways of doing church. Why are there so many different ways? Because Scripture is not 100% absolutely clear on this is the exact way it's to be done. Because I know very godly individuals that are super studied and have written papers and books to advocate for their position, and they're very different. So there are important things that we can have differences on, but how are we going to navigate that? And then as another thing to take note of as we look at this, when Paul refers to the weak and the strong, he's not referring uh, to those individuals who spent a lot of time in the gym and those who've spent a lot of time on the couch. That's not what he's referring to. As you read weak and strong, generally he's referring to, when he refers to the weak, he's referring to those individuals who maybe hold certain issues very highly to the point that they would say, everyone, to be a Christian, you must do this. But yet maybe, Chris, maybe the scriptures aren't super clear that that is like something every Christian should do. Like that's someone, they have a conviction, but yet they're holding it super tightly and to the strong, he's referring to those that, that maybe are, are, have walked with the Lord longer, they're older in their faith, and they've come to realize, yeah, there's important issues, but we don't need to die in those hills. So that's what he's referring to. And, and we, as we address that, as we look at it, let's not quickly go, well, clearly I am of one of the strong people that Paul is referring to, so I need to listen when Paul is addressing the strong, and then it's that other person that's sitting across the aisle, I hope they are listening, because they're clearly the weak. Okay? We will address that. So let's dive in. Look at your Bibles. Look at what it says in verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. But do not quarrel over opinions. So first action to consider, do not argue. Do not argue. So you can have a difference of opinion and not argue. You can have a healthy dialogue and not argue. But you felt that in a context. Maybe there's somebody who has a strong opinion about something, and as soon as that comes up, like the temperature starts to rise inside, or maybe you feel it, like you felt strongly about something, and you just want to, you just want to have a conversation. Let's, we need to talk about this. I want to ask you, what, when that comes, what drives your interactions with others? Because Paul's saying. Don't quarrel, right? because that's, like, that's the first thing he addresses. 
because he's obviously observing quarreling that's happened. Have you considered that you could be wrong? Well, of course I could be wrong, but I'm not. Have you considered? Have you considered they could be right? Well, it's within the realm of possibility that they could be right, but they're wrong. So if you start with they are wrong, well, of course, it's gonna, you're just going to come to blows. Hopefully it won't come to like blows, blows, but it, they start to argue. Have you considered they may have a perspective that you need to hear? Maybe you don't have to fully agree, but have you listened? Or do you think that you are God? Now, I don't think there's anyone here in the room that would go, yeah, I woke up this morning thinking I'm as smart as God is, and I hope everybody else knows it. I don't think anyone in the room would say that. But functionally, that's what happens when we come to dialogue and we immediately put the hand up because we have clearly have the right perspective and they don't. It's possible you are the immature one. And now, be, be, like I know, some of you are like, no, it's, that's not me, but I hope you're talking to that person across the room. No, we're, we're here this morning. As you engage with this this morning, engage with what God wants you to hear from this text. Not what, what the, your spouse needs to hear or someone in your small group or someone that you serve with. What do you need to hear? You could be proud. You could be ignorant. The person that is, disagrees with you actually could be open to a ha- healthy dialogue about a matter. They could be. Don't immediately go to, well, if if they believe this, I saw what they posted, that means if they posted this, that means I know this about them and this about them and this about them. Friends, we aren't God. And we're going to talk about judging in just a moment. But here's the reality. Arguing puts up walls and breeds division. But On the flip side, asking questions, asking questions acknowledges, I am not God. He knows everything. He knows hearts. I don't know their heart, so I need to ask questions to understand their heart. Asking questions seeks to understand, and actually asking questions breeds unity rather than division. Because the asking questions doesn't mean you're all going to end on the same page, but it does mean you'll come to a place of understanding. So first action to consider, do not argue. If you notice yourself arguing with someone or arguing with a category of people perpetually, you may want to ask the question, where's my heart in that? So do not argue. Then look back at your Bibles. Look back at your Bibles. Look what it says. It says, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. The call is for us not to judge. Why? Because God has welcomed him. You are here this morning, you maybe consistently come to our faith family because God has welcomed you into his family and we are part of God's family. That means everyone else in this room and those who are serving are not able to be here today. God has welcomed them. So we must, we must realize he is, has, has accepted them. And theologian John Stott wrote this. He really uh, had uh, an exceptional way of kind of unpacking this. This is what he said. He said, how dare we reject a person whom God has accepted? He said, indeed, the best way to determine what our attitude to other people should be is to determine what God's attitude to them is. This principle is better even than the golden rule to treat others as we should treat ourselves. It is safe to treat others as we would like them to treat us, but it is safer still to treat them as God does. We want to treat others as God does. God is 
patient and he is merciful. God actually knows the hearts, but he doesn't quickly come to judgment or to conclusions, and he walks with others. But we, we aren't God, so we can come to conclusions really quickly. This, this could have happened to me recently. I'm just going to share a story. I'm, I'm training to, to run a race. I know I don't look like a runner. When you see me run, you would affirm I don't look like a runner. But I'm, I'm wanting to run, so I'm training, and I was running near my house and there's someone in our midst that uh, also runs, and I saw them. And one day, this is a couple months ago, uh, we, we were on opposite sides of the street, and we passed each other. And, you know, I'm exhausted because I'm, like, <laughs> sweaty and hot. And I just kind of like, hey. And they didn't acknowledge me as we went past each other. Now, in God's mercy, I didn't go down wrong roads. Like, immediately for me, in God's mercy, I realized you know, my family has told me, like, I work with blinders on. Like, they go, hey, Dad, I'm talking to you. So I'm like, you know, that was probably happening. But you know where my mind could have gone as we passed on the road? I could have been like, well, he looks like a runner. He must, he must think I'm fat and slow. And so he can't even be bothered by thinking, by even acknowledging my existence because he just went, he didn't even look at me, he didn't acknowledge me. I can't believe he's such a judgmental jerk. Only to learn from his wife two weeks later, oh yeah, he does that all the time. He has no idea anyone's around when he runs. I was like, yeah, that's what I thought. But you can see where my heart could have gone. How many times has your heart gone there when you have engaged with someone about something? Or you've seen someone in our church post something on social media and you immediately have run down a road. Listen, we aren't God. Hey, to, to loop back around, I went for a run yesterday. I saw that person, and they were like, go, go, go. Like, he encouraged me. I was so encouraged by that because, like, he's a much better runner than me. So, so there's no issue there between me and that individual. But listen, friends, we aren't God. We don't know people's hearts. And when we get to the place where we start to judge motives, we start to say, that's why they're doing this. That's why they think what they're thinking. We're sinning. The only person who's qualified to judge is Jesus because he sees everything. He knows all the details. We don't judge not just because God says don't judge. We aren't qualified to judge because we don't know. That's why it's so important for us to ask questions. It's so important for us to start with they are here because of God's initiative. God has welcomed them. And it goes on, look at verse 4, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Remember, God is the only judge. He's the only one. Jesus is the one that is the master that does the judging. On the last day, no one will stand before you, but you will stand before him. You will stand before God. So when a matter, disagreement, difference of opinion comes up, how will these truths inform your interaction? Will you immediately project your conviction on them or will you seek to understand so that you don't come to the place of judgment? It's amazing what a conversation will do. It's absolutely amazing what a conversation will do. And I'm not just referring to the conversations that you do have. I'm also referring to the conversations that you sometimes choose not to have. Like sometimes someone uh, says something in the context of, of an interaction, small group, maybe you're talking after church, they say something and it rubs you the wrong way or you think differently and then you're like, you know, I'm not going to say anything or that's in the past. Yet you continue to think about it when you see them, it informs if you lean into that relationship or go away from that relationship. 
These principles still refer to even not having a conversation. Some of you need to have a conversation with somebody else in our church. I don't have a particular situation in mind. So no, nobody think, did someone tell him? Is he talking about me? I don't, but I think some of you probably do. And, or sometime in the future, it's going to happen. We need to have the conversation because you don't want to judge. You want to understand. So we don't want to argue. We don't want to judge. Look back at your Bible. Look at verse 5. It says, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all alike. Uh, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Now, what Paul is saying there is have conviction. So he starts with don't judge. He starts with don't argue. But he says have a conviction. Be fully convinced in your own mind. So Paul addressing these things isn't saying don't have an opinion about anything. Just don't hold anything tightly. No, he's saying be, be cautious not to run the risk of, of holding things too tightly where we, every conviction we have is we're dying on every single hill. He's saying avoid that, but also avoid, you know, the place that's like it, nothing really matters. It really doesn't matter what you believe. It, it, it's okay. He's saying avoid those two extremes. Have a conviction. My question is, what drives your convictions? Where do you get the information that informs your convictions? What's the foundation for your convictions? Is it God's Word? Or is it something that just provokes your emotions that you've read? Does it come from long-term prayer and study about an issue? Or does it come from video clips that you've watched that are just super quick, you have 30 seconds, and they, they evoke an emotion in you. I'm not saying that social media and other places aren't helpful places. You can find good truth that's out there. But you don't build a conviction off of a 30-second soundbite. You can't be sustained on something that you can read in five minutes or less. God wants us to have convictions that are rooted in his word. When something comes up, and particularly if a disagreement comes up, like, are, are you diving into God's word? Have you asked the question, where, how have I come to my conviction on this? I'm being very careful not to mention certain issues or disagreements. I kind of feel like I'm walking, and I'm, like there's landmines everywhere. Because I don't want you to be distracted by a particular issue. Are Oreos better or Chips Ahoy? Which one is it? One is better than the other. Well, clearly one is better, and I can't believe they would think that way. Hopefully you have not had a disagreement about that. Have both. Like, <laughs> uh, just want to make light of the reality. Like, there are serious issues that we should have conviction about. Are you studied in your conviction? Are you going to places to ask for input that you, you are, are, are studying thoroughly? Are you going to places, you know, I would commend a, a particular organization called the Gospel Coalition. So not, not to be confused with our network of churches, which, which is the Great Commission Collective. They're two different organizations but the Gospel Coalition was started by some pastors that said, we, we want to resource churches and encourage churches. And there are others that are out there, have articles and written by authors who studied in books to give different perspectives on things so that Christians can have a studied perspective on various issues because there's so many of them that we have to encounter and engage with. So let's be studied. Let's have conviction. And then let's live out of those convictions. Look at verse 6. He says, The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. 
For if we live, we're to live to the Lord. If we die, we're to die to the Lord. So we are to live for the Lord. Let's live out of our convictions. So Paul's not saying just have, just be able to write a paper on what you believe. No, live, live out of that. Don't be wavering to and fro. Have, have a conviction. And as you develop your convictions, ask, can I do this before Christ? Can I do this with an eye upon Jesus? Can I do this in his name? Thanking him for it. So even in your own conviction, as you're developing your conviction, and here's a reality. I'm growing, and I know that you're growing. So sometimes our convictions change because we study God's word. I can assure you, when I was a new Christian, I was starting to read my Bible, and I was rock-solid confident that I was right. I was skilled at arguing. And the sad reality is I probably alienated more people than I won anyone to any perspective. But God in his mercy has been kind to me to humble me sometimes because older men have been, women have spoken truth into my life or walking through circumstances. We're going to grow. So sometimes we'll change our con- conviction because we've spent time in God's word. There's times where I've read and went, oh, yep, I've held that too tightly. I need to own that. Sometimes that means we need to go to somebody and ask for forgiveness. But we should be studied in our conviction and and live out of that conviction because we belong to the Lord. We're to live for the Lord. So have a conviction. Just don't judge others for the conviction that they have. And as you walk it out, stay focused on the God to whom you will give an account. Now look at your Bibles because these, were, these words right here are very sobering. Look at what it says. It says, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord... Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. On the last day, we stand before God alone, by his grace, washed in the blood of Jesus. But we stand before God. May, may we not use phrases like, how can you be a Christian and believe fill in the blank? You certainly can't be a Christian and vote for Donald Duck. I know that's who you're all thinking, right? Who will the one who's been welcomed into the family, who are they going to stand for on the last day? Is it going to be you? No, it won't be. We must be sobered as we disagree. The reality is, is we're all going to get there for one reason, and that's because of Jesus' blood alone. That's the only thing that's going to get us there. The favor that we have is because of what Jesus has done, not because you figured something out and someone else hasn't figured something out. We get there by his mercy. That's why the beginning of this whole section at the beginning of chapter 12 is in view of God's mercy. We must keep God's mercy in view, which also has us in a place of being sobered. Do you engage in conversation with others knowing you will stand before God and give an account. Do you do do that? Now, there's so much more in the passage. 
Because in verse 13 it says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. There, there was just arrogance and divisiveness that was happening. People were so wrapped up in their perspective that they just didn't care about their brother or sister. They didn't say, well, I'll I'll willingly set aside to serve. I mean, some of you have done that. Maybe you have friends who have certain diets or maybe they've come from religious backgrounds and you're sharing Christ with them and you're like, yeah, okay, Uh, when they come over, we're going to make sure that We don't have certain things in the house or in view when they're here. You're not compromising. You're just saying, no, I want to love them more than me. I want to serve them more than me. And we would think, well, yeah, when it comes to food, I'm going to serve them more than me. But with other things, we might be like, well, oh, they just need to grow up. Have you said that? Maybe not out of your mouth, but in the back of your mind. Have you thought? Others in in various ways. I've had a number of of pastors who have come to preach and open God's word for us. And it's amazing how frequent this question comes to me as they prepare. You know, they'll ask different things. They'll ask where the church is at because they want to know how they can serve. But most often they'll ask, what should I wear? And when they ask that question, they are saying, it doesn't matter what I do at my church. What, what should I wear? Because when I come into your church, the last thing I want to do is distract them from the Word of God by what I'm wearing. So if I'm going to go preach somewhere, I'm going to ask that. If I'm going to go to a church that their conviction is that the pastor always preaches in a suit and a tie, I'm not going to show up looking like this. Some of you already, when I came in, they're like, oh, pastor's wearing sandals today. That's really cool. And some other people might have been like, I can't believe he's preaching the word in sandals. I don't know where you're at. But if I'm going to that church, do I like wearing a tie and a suit, particularly in the summer? I don't, ever. But I'm going to wear it. Why? Because I want to serve. So what are some of the issues for you that you'd be like, you know, I might wear that thing. Or I might not bring up that issue. Or whatever it might be. Are you thinking that way as you go to engage with a brother or sister in Christ? Particularly if it's an issue where they're still growing and they might be caused to stumble. Can you set aside your rights to serve others? Can you serve others by setting aside your rights? And I don't have time to get into every particular issue. Yes, we have freedom in Christ, but never should we access that freedom at the expense of a brother or sister in Christ. That doesn't mean like if you see someone doing something, you're concerned, maybe that might not be the most helpful thing. They might not be aware of this passage. Don't begin the conversation with going, you're not loving. Again, let's not assume they're not being loving. Let's start with a question and say, hey, can I ask you a couple questions? I noticed you're doing this. Uh, you know, uh, you're, you're making bacon during the service. I just noticed that, that why, why do you make it? it, it's distracting. Like if someone actually was doing that, right, wouldn't that be so distracting? Like you would have no idea what I'm saying and you would be smelling that. You'd want to know where that is. You'd be getting up and going, hey, can I have some? But there are things that people do that are that distracting for you. Are you going to go and you're going to ask the question? Understand where they're at rather than judge their motives. Maybe say, hey, have you thought about this? Have you considered this? Oh, I have never, never considered that. I had my pastor in college tell me we're on a trip somewhere, and uh, I was I was kind of grumpy looking. I, there were reasons. Maybe I was tired, a long day, and I wasn't really engaging people in conversation. He didn't come to me and go, you're such a mean, angry person. I can't believe you're so self-righteous and judgmental. And we said, hey, um, did you notice that you didn't really talk to anybody and you didn't smile? Oh, I didn't notice, I, I didn't notice at all. 
I didn't notice that at all. My brother said this to me one time. I had the privilege of leading worship when I was in college. He came to visit the college I was at. I was leading worship, and he's like, hey, did you know that you don't, you don't ever smile when you lead worship? Like, did you know you, you look angry? And we're, you know, I know you're passionate, but you, you just look mad. We're worshiping Jesus. I had no idea. I had no idea. I'm thinking I'm passionately worshiping and I'm communicating God hates us <laughs> with my face. But because of that loving interaction, I was able to see. So serving others. Because ultimately we serve the Lord Jesus. Whoever, verse 18, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by God. Who are you serving? Who is at the forefront of every interaction? Is it Christ? When you interact with individuals, is your goal to win the argument of someone who's different? So it could be someone in our church. It could be someone outside our church. Is your goal for them to leave with the aroma of Christ? Or is your goal for to, the, for, to win them to your perspective? Because you clearly are right. Is your goal to build them up in the Lord or is your goal to persuade them to your opinion? Is your goal for them to bask in the wonder of how much you know? Or is your goal to equip them with the truth of Scripture so they can actually come to their own conclusion? And it might be different than your conclusion, but... Will you point them to the Word of God to, to have them and have our church be a bunch of Bereans who study the Scriptures and live out of the Scriptures and see if it's so? That's what we want. We want, we want folks that build their own conviction based on God's Word, that they, that they get their feeding from God, not from us. That they would abide in Christ. And, and lastly, as as we look at the various convictions, we're called to pursue peace. Look at verse 17. It says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in this Holy Spirit. Jump down to verse 19. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Oh, if we just had that verse and the forefront of our minds as we engage in any dialogue, not just ones where we have a difference of opinion, but particularly if we have a difference of opinion. Do I have in my mind, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutually upbuilding? Like if I memorize that verse and that's on the forefront of my mind, like the issue of, of arguing and judging just kind of comes off the table because my goal is to pursue peace. Peace. My goal is to build them up. How am I going to build them up? Now, building them up might be challenging them. It might be going to the Scriptures, ironing, sharpening iron. That does build one another up. But we do it in such a way that pursues peace. It doesn't bring division to where we just like, oh, I noticed that person. I think I'm just going to avoid them. No, rather we, we lean in. Are you pursuing peace or do you just want to be right? Are you pursuing peace or would you rather just think you know what they think and, and create distance? We need to ask that question. Now remember where Paul began this section. Way back in verse 12, he says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. We would not be here if it weren't for God's mercy. The reality is, brothers and sisters, you would not have the convictions that you have about very important matters if God had not saved you and redeemed you and forgave you and, and, and begun and continues his transforming work in you. 
you wouldn't even have your perspectives right now because you would be blind, you would be, your heart would be hard, you'd be running hard towards hell rather than wanting to please your generous and good and merciful God had He not acted upon you. Let's keep that in mind as we consider disputable matters with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean that we all must believe exactly the same thing about every single matter. But it absolutely looks like a community that's marked by love and peace, not division. One that looks to Christ and leaves the secondary matters to be secondary matters. then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you right now, I'm aware there are numerous application points. There are so many truths we could be focusing on, and it has felt overwhelming. I pray, God, that you would settle our hearts right now and deal with us. Right where you are, engage with God. Before you take a step forward and even confess where conviction has come, Thank God for welcoming you. Thank God for welcoming those in this room, those watching from home who have trusted in Christ. Just take a moment and just thank God. Even thank God with specific names or for specific ways that God has welcomed you when you otherwise shouldn't be here. Just right where you are. And then take a moment where you are and confess where God has brought conviction, where you have been argumentative or where you have been judgmental. You don't have to say it out loud. It's between you and the Lord. Maybe there's a specific person you need to confess that you have judged them. Maybe they're in our church. Maybe they're not in our church. Maybe they're in your family or in your neighborhood. Just confess before the Lord. Just be real before the Lord. Right where you are. Now ask God. Ask God to help you have your convictions be informed by Scripture. God, help me. Help me to engage with these individuals. Help me. Maybe you need to pray for someone in specific because there's a conversation God is nudging you to have and you're struggling. You're not, you're not sure. You're not sure how they're going to hear it well or you're afraid to say it or you just don't know what to say. Ask for God's help. What we've opened here in the Word is God's heart. So when we have His heart, we will get His help. Just ask for God's help for that specific situation. Well, Father, we yield to You. We want to be lovers of You more than anything else. And we want that affection to transform the way in which we live. We want to live for Christ, not to earn His favor, but because we have His favor. So Lord, we yield to You in these things, even when they're hard, even when there's a reminder that we, we kind of feel like we should already know it, Lord, would we yield to You? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be reminded of what was most important in this passage 
and that is that we have been welcomed into God's family. We're going to be reminded of what Christ has done. So I'm going to invite the, the communion servers to come forward. And I want to read this to you as they come forward to have this in mind. It says in Romans 4, 7 and following, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. If you have trusted in Jesus, you are the recipient of that blessing. And you should rejoice in it as you come. Even if you're struggling, even as God is growing you, He, he is growing you. No one here has it all together. Not one person, starting with me. We're all in process. But as we come, if you need to stay in your seat because you realize you are not right with a brother or sister in this room or even outside this room, and you need to not take communion because we, want, we don't want to take it in an unworthy manner, as, as, as the Scripture says. Some of you may just need to stay in your seat and not take communion this time because you know after the service or later today or this week, you need to engage with somebody because maybe you've sinned against them in your heart. They might not even know. That's okay. As you come before the Lord, you can confess with your mouth those sins, and he's going to forgive you of those. But I want to invite you to come. Come and be reminded of what Christ has done before we take those steps. As we grow in navigating disputable matters, let's, let's rejoice in the undisputable matter and that Jesus said, it is finished.